Good morning, everyone. You can remain standing, and if you'll turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, we're going to cover this morning Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. If you don't have a Bible, I believe it will be on the screen over here. And if you don't have a Bible, there are plenty of people from Crossway who can get you a Bible, including, including myself. But Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him, Jesus, to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out from them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and when he sat down and he taught and then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we have toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were, also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you'll be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. This is God's word. Amen. You may be seated. Please join me in prayer. Father, we are so grateful to meet here this morning. We're grateful for this space to meet and to sing and to pray. And Lord, we're also so grateful that each and every week you give us your word, the Bible, which is sufficient to Teach us what we need to know about ourselves, about the world, and most importantly, about you. So teach us now, Lord. Teach us to know Jesus better so we might love and serve and honor him more. We pray this in his name. Amen. The famous American poet said it well. One fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. Black fish, blue fish, old fish, new fish. This one had a little star, this one had a little car. Say, what a lot of fish there are. Whatever inspired these opening lines of Dr. Seuss's magisterial work, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, it was likely not Simon Peter's terrible night of fishing. For Peter and his companions, as we just heard, they toiled all night upon the lake of Gennesaret, also called the Sea of Galilee, without any fish to show for their hours of effort. Within this lake, which was 13 miles long, eight miles wide, these skilled fishermen came to shore empty-handed, not one fish, not two, not a red fish, nor blue. And so these fishermen, surely discouraged, they beached their boats, they began this tedious and tiresome task of cleaning these heavy fishing nets. Yet on this occasion, the usual monotony of washing and mending was, was broken by the presence in the morning there of this large crowd that was pressing upon Jesus. Evidently, Jesus' supernatural authority over demons and diseases, which is highlighted in chapter 4 of Luke's gospel, resulted in the gathering that morning of this curious crowd. Luke, however, without downplaying the significance of Jesus' power, his exorcisms and healings, he draws our attention here at the start of chapter 5 to the authority of Jesus' teaching, his teaching. This particular crowd, according to Luke, gathered around the Lord because they were interested in what he had to say. Look at verse 1. The crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear the word of God. An interesting phrase that Luke uses, to hear the word of God from the Son of God. And so Jesus, seeing the crowd was hungry to hear, and seeing the fish that he was after that day, Peter and John and their brothers, were near, our Lord simply stepped into Simon Peter's boat, and he asked Simon if he wouldn't mind, if he'd be so kind, just to push him out a bit 
from the land. And in this way, teaching the people from the boat, as verse 3 describes it, using Peter's boat as a, a floating pulpit, he's likely sitting, a teacher would sit, think of the Sermon on the Mount as a position of authority, also for balance, on a boat. And he would use the hill behind them in the water as a natural amphitheater. His voice would carry over to the crowd, but it would also carry to the men right there on the shore, maybe still in the water, those frustrated fishermen. You see, our Lord wanted to make sure that they, although they're the only characters in the story that didn't come that morning to hear Jesus give the word of God, they're returning from work, he wanted to make sure that they would hear the word of God, a sermon that perhaps began as Jesus' earlier sermons began in Mark and in Matthew, repent, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And this focus on this fisherman is, is why Luke moves us away from this wide-angle lens in verses 1 through 3. We see this grand panoramic view of Jesus surrounded by hundreds, perhaps thousands of thirsty souls. He changes that view to a very narrow lens in verses 4 through 11, where the crowd, in a sense, disappears completely from our view. And it's just Jesus and Simon, for the most part. They come clearly into focus. So verse 4 begins, And when he, Jesus, had finished speaking to the multitudes, he turned to Simon Peter, and he gave a very strange sermon application. He didn't give an altar call. He didn't ask him to sign a response card. He didn't say, if you're interested in learning more about the essentials of the Christian faith, there's a table at the back. No, he said to Simon, let's go fishing. Let's go fishing. Let's, you and me, go fishing. He said to Simon, verse 4, put out into the deep, that is, we're going to need to get back in the boat and go out a bit, put out into the deep, and then let down your nets for a catch. Now, I'm not a, I'm not a fisherman of any caliber. In fact, the last time I went out fishing, some 20 years ago, I spent the entire morning trying to untangle my failed cast. And my son was there, my oldest son was there with me, and he could attest to this. I'm not a fisherman. But I do know that what Peter asked here to do from a human standpoint, from a fisherman's standpoint, is absolutely outrageous. It's outrageous. Think about it. Jesus, what did he do for a living most of his life? He was a carpenter. A carpenter, not a fisherman. He was a carpenter from where? He was from the hill country of Nazareth. The closest lake to his hometown was a two-mile walk. He was a landlubber. He is telling Peter, an expert Galilean fisherman, a man who'd spent his whole adult life earning a living from catching fish, a man who was exhausted from a whole night of laboring in vain, he is telling Peter to reload his heavy and perhaps now cleaned fishing gear back into the boat, then row out, sail out to deep enough waters and then circle around while he sets these huge nets in place, these trammel nets. These are nets that were designed for night fishing, which he was just doing. It's morning now. For night fishing when the fish couldn't see them. That's what he's telling Peter to do. That's the request. That's the ridiculous request. And yet Peter, after some reservation, he obeyed the word of Jesus. Wow. And Simon answered, Master. He'll call him Master here. It's one Greek word. And later, listen for this word. It's a more important word. He'll call him Lord in just a minute. Master. Master, we toiled all night and took in nothing. Pause. But at your word. He knew something of the power of Jesus' word. He had probably heard Jesus preach in the synagogue. He had just heard Jesus preach on the shore if he was listening. And you might also remember earlier in Luke, Jesus had come to his house and by the power of his word had healed the fever of his mother-in-law. But at your word, I trust your word, I will go out and I will let down my nets. And so after some reservation, we don't know how long the pause was between we toiled all night and took nothing to, but at your word, Peter obeyed this crazy command. It's remarkable. It is a remarkable reaction. But not as remarkable as about what is about to happen, the, the remarkableness of Jesus' miracle itself. Just look at verses 6 and 7. 
And here, you old-time Christians, don't, don't let this miracle's familiarity breed contempt. Instead, let its familiarity breed faith in you and worship. And when they, Peter and his companions, had done this, once they went out, once they let their nets down just once, the first time, they enclosed a large number of fish. One fish, two fish, three hundred fish. So many fish that the nets were breaking. They, they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came, and they filled both the boats. These boats were seven feet, seven and a half feet wide, 20 seven feet long and these boats biggish type of fishing boats began to sink now can't you just picture them at this point rowing feverishly to the shore hoping the weight of this these fish will won't drown them and can't you picture them as they're doing that with with smiles on their face what a miracle what a miracle or was it it became popular a few centuries ago for New Testament scholars who were influenced by the Enlightenment rationalism to explain away all the supernatural uh, effects of Jesus' miracles in, in rationalistic and in natural ways. And William Barclay, for example, standing in this tradition, he understands what happened here is just a natural phenomenon. He puts it this way, most likely Jesus just saw a school of fish with his keen eyesight and it made it look like a miracle. It was no miracle. It looked like one. Jesus just had better eyesight than these fishermen. Better sight is all that Barclay makes of this event. And so according to him, all that we can take away from this great catch is that we, like Jesus, are to have, quote, here's his application, have a keen eye that sees. To have a keen eye that sees. Well, what absolute nonsense. Or as my Irish grandmother used to say, musha, rubbish. What absolute rubbish. And thank God, Peter didn't respond in this way to this authentic miracle. He didn't say, oh, oh, sir, I do pray I have better vision next time I go out fishing. I'd hate to miss such a catch as this. Rather, and I want you to see this, as verse 8 indicates, when Simon Peter saw the mighty work of God that stirred beneath and rose above these familiar waters, when he grasped at the fish that swam and jumped by, were commanded by this man Jesus just as the, the flies that flew and the locusts that swarmed over Egypt in the days of Moses Peter reacted in verse 9 with astonishment but also first and before that in verse 8 like this he fell down at Jesus' knees now what's he falling on? he's falling on all these fish right? he falls down on these fish tips up his head to Jesus, and what does he say? He says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Now, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I, I love the unexpected. I love the surprises in God's word, and here's one of them. You see, as strange as Jesus' request in verse 4 was to sail out into the apparent fruitless, fishless sea of Galilee, Peter's response here in verse 8 is even more unusual. It's one thing to, to bow down before someone who is great, like a, a ruler of an empire, but quite another thing to bow before and say to the son of a poor Jewish carpenter from the nowhere town of Nazareth, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Where we'd expect maybe a, a comment of awe or gratitude, wow, that's something else, thanks Jesus. Or perhaps we'd expect a manly defense of his ability as a fisherman. Well, that's fine, Jesus, what you can do here, but come back at 2 a.m. sharp and I'll show you what I can do. Instead, we have here from Peter a humble posture. Proskuneo is the, the Greek word. It's used of worship often translated in the Bible. He kneels, he bows, he worships before Jesus. Then he confesses. His unworthiness, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. And finally, he gives a recognition of Christ's sovereignty, his divine sovereignty. Kurie, he says. It's the Greek for what's in the Septuagint, the Old Testament, used for the Lord God. He calls Jesus Lord. And isn't that surprising? Isn't that wonderfully surprising? A friend of mine from high school uh, Vince, who was just a, a tremendous uh, basketball player, he used to work as a, a counselor for uh, Michael Jordan's summer basketball camps, perhaps with 
with your pastor here, I don't know, but this illustration is for him to keep him awake uh, and for you to make sure that you have enough basketball illustrations uh, while he's gone from the pulpit. Anyway, back to the story. While, while Vince and the others were there, uh, at night all the counselors would get together and Jordan himself would show up from time to time. Now my friend Vince, he had the privilege, the embarrassing privilege of guarding Jordan most of the time. And one night, Vince told me while he was guarding the goat, children, that is the greatest of all time, that means, Jordan caught the ball on the baseline with his back to the basket. You've probably seen this on TV. He faked to the right, he went to the right, and he glided swiftly to the basket, untouched by all defenders, and with great authority, dunked the ball. Now afterwards, when MJ and Vince D were running up the court, striding side by side, Jordan turned to him and said, whispered almost, much quicker than TV, isn't it? <laughs> now that's one way to intimidate, to make someone feel small, inadequate, inferior. And I think we've all felt that way in, in the presence of some remarkable person. But what is different here with Peter is that he is not merely gripped by a sense of inferiority. Okay, Jesus, you're faster, you're quicker, you're smarter, you're better, you're more powerful than me. He is gripped not merely by a sense of his inferiority, but by a sense of his own sinfulness, his own sinfulness. And remember, and this is important, remember, Peter's not some lawless criminal. He's not some anti-religious anarchist. Sure, he has his flaws, and all the gospel writers tell us about his flaws, but none of those same writers depict him as a bad guy or as a, a sinner like Zacchaeus or the woman we'll encounter in chapter 7 or the thief on the cross. Peter is your everyday man. He, he's you. He's me. But when this everyday man recognizes that he's all of a sudden in the presence of the everlasting man, as G.K. Chesterton called Jesus, well, what happens? Well, Peter like Abraham, like Job, like Moses, like Isaiah, when they came into the presence of God, he, like them, he says in essence, woe is me, I am undone, I am unclean. He is shaking, he is trembling, he's fearing for his life. Get away from me, Jesus, lest I die. Now I think we can all understand how people naturally fear something or fear somebody when they've witnessed great wickedness. Think of what we older adults in the room witnessed on September 11 many years ago, those unexpected and inexplicable acts of evil. To witness that, as some of us did, is to fear it, to fear terrorism. What is difficult for us to grasp, however, is how someone like Peter could respond in fear after he has witnessed and an extraordinary act, not of wickedness, but of goodness. Each and every fish squirming, thrashing about in his nets is a visible and fragrant reminder of this fact, and yet don't overlook this one, face to face with the person and power of Jesus, with Jesus' goodness. Peter's soul didn't overflow with joy, but rather it flooded with a sense of his own shame. Which honestly makes me pause and think how ironic it is today that many Christians, perhaps you, perhaps me at times, earnestly we seek the presence of God. You can listen to some of our Christian worship songs. Oh God, I want to touch you, hold you, cuddle next to you. How ironic that many Christians earnestly seek the presence of God, little realizing that every time that God reveals his presence, his glory in its fullness in the Bible, men and women were struck with terror and almost rendered lifeless. I don't think we know what we're saying when we casually express our desires to more fully encounter the living and almighty and holy, holy, holy God. Yes, it is true right now, as we are gathered this day in the presence of Christ, let me tell you, Christ is in our midst but if the glory of Christ came further in our midst at a deeper measure than it is right now, we wouldn't be applauding in elation as if a celebrity walked in the back door. We wouldn't be laughing hysterically as if a comic told a great joke. 
No, we would all be bowing down with our faces flat on the floor in repentant fear, in repentant fear. And do you get that? Do you get what Peter sees here? And Luke wants us to see it, to see, to understand that if we were to follow Jesus and thus to experience something beyond just fear, but his mercy and his grace, well, we must first, like Peter, we must first have a sense of our own sinfulness, our own innate sinfulness. You see, before Luke illustrates, at the end of chapter 5 through the end of chapter 7, Jesus' ministry of forgiveness to the least, least likely members of society, to a leper, a paralytic, a tax collector, chapter 5, a Gentile centurion, chapter 6, a, a prostitute, chapter 7. Before he does all that, he shows us Peter, this man who is no religious, social, moral outclass. He shows us Simon Peter to say, see, Simon sees and says that he's a sinner. And if Simon says he's a sinner, if Simon says it, well, we better play along, although this is no game. If Simon says it, you and I should say it too. And that's the point, that we must admit our spiritual poverty before we can obtain the riches of the gospel. We must admit our spiritual poverty before we can obtain the riches of the gospel. We must join Peter in saying, O oh Lord, I too am a sinful man. I too am a sinful woman. I too am a sinful child. Matthew Henry, the great commentator, said it well when he wrote, wrote those whom Christ designs to admit to the most intimate acquaintance with him, he first makes sensible that they deserve to be set at the greatest distance from him. And through this miracle, through Jesus' miracle, this is what he's doing. This is certainly what he did with Peter, created this distance. Yet the story doesn't end there, does it? No, once Simon is made aware of this reality, and once he admits his unworthiness, Jesus does something. He next offers him a consolation and a commission, a consolation and a commission. At the end of verse 10, Jesus consoles him, saying, do not be afraid. And then Jesus commissions him, saying, from now on, you'll be catching, you'll be catching men. And you know, the first part of this response to Peter is consolation, his words, do not be afraid. It reminds me of the scene in Victor Hugo's Les Mis, where in the main character, Jean Valjean, is caught stealing the bishop's expensive silverware that the bishop so gracefully provided him with food and shelter the night before. And some of you may remember the scene. When the police escort the thief back to the bishop's house and uh, for questioning and for retribution, the bishop, instead of denouncing him and accusing him, he graciously defends this man who struck him and stole from him. And the movie rendition, I don't have time to read the big book, the movie rendition, perhaps you recall it, has this splendid dialogue. The bishop, the pastor, he says to the police lieutenant, didn't he tell you that it was, he was our guest last night? The lieutenant responds, oh yes, we searched his knapsack, we found all the silver, and he claimed, he claimed that you gave it to him. The bishop slightly pauses and says, yes, of course I gave him the silverware. And then he turns to Jean Valjean, he said, but why didn't you take the candlesticks? That was foolish, they're worth at least 2,000 francs, a lot of money. Why did you leave them? The police lieutenant, is stunned by this admission, says, Are you telling us that he told the truth? Of course, the bishop hesitantly replied. Thank you for bringing him back. I'm very relieved. Now, after Jean Valjean is released into the bishop's custody and the police leave the scene, the bishop places the candlesticks, candlesticks back into the thief's knapsack. He looks him at the eye and, playing off a phrase that Jean Valjean said at dinner the night before, the bishop says to him, and don't forget, don't you ever forget that you promised to become a new man. Promise? What? Why are you doing this? Jean Valjean, my brother, you no longer belong to evil. With this silver I bought your soul. I've ransomed you from fear, and now I give you back to God. I have ransomed you from fear, and now I give you back to God. In this beautiful scene, 
The bishop never said a word of forgiveness, but by his gracious actions, he demonstrated the pardon he gave to this man for his offense. And here in our text, although Peter is no thief, he admits he's a sinner, he's offered similarly divine absolution and reconciliation through Jesus' words of consolation. Do not be afraid. In other words, Peter, I have ransomed you from fear, from the fear of God's judgment that you're feeling right now. And now, I give you to God. I give you into the service of God's kingdom. And just as that heartless convict was transformed that very moment by that single act of kindness, so too, Peter, with his encounter with Jesus, Peter was forever changed. He was changed from Peter the fisherman into Peter the fisher of men. From this defining moment, Peter will no longer catch fish in the sea in order to bring them, sell them in the marketplace. Rather, he will catch people in the marketplace and give them back to God. And catch he did, didn't he? We know the story. You remember his Pentecost sermon, for example, recorded in Acts 2, where he supernaturally empowered by the Holy Spirit, he unashamedly presented the glorious mystery of our faith where he preached Christ, our Lord's life and death, and resurrection, where he preached the need for repentance, repent, repent for the forgiveness of sins. And what happened? Repent they did. 3,000 fish took the bait, hook, line, and center, uh, sinker. God, through Peter's preaching of the gospel, as Phil Riken puts it, rescued people from the deep sea of their sin and brought them safely to the shore of salvation. Now, I know, and trust me, I know that I'm not Peter, you're not Peter, we're not Peter, and today's not Pentecost. But oh, like Peter, and oh, like that day of Pentecost, oh, that we would be fishers of men, fishers of people. But when's the last time, quite honestly, when's the last time you've gone fishing? I mean, when's the last time you walked out your front door, stepped out of your cubicle to meet, to help a neighbor, a coworker? A stranger to build a relationship with them for the purpose of the gospel? When's the last time you invited these friends that you're building a relationship with over for dessert or dinner? When's the last time you prayed for these people God has providentially put into your life? When's the last time you shared your faith with them, how you came to know Christ, how it's, Jesus is worth looking into? When's the last time you invited them, if you're afraid to do everything I just mentioned, to church? Take them to church to hear God's word preached and to see God's people together worship. Oh, that we would be a church, that this would be a particular local church that hangs outside the door from the moment we leave this building to the moment you return next Sunday, a sign that says, gone fishing. Gone fishing. Because we've all been out fishing for men and for women and children. Oh, that we, like Peter, would take the good news of Jesus to the world. I pray that for you, and you can pray that for me. I can preach it, but I need help fishing as well. Well, in these first ten verses, Peter, from a human standpoint, has made foolish response after foolish response. In verse 5, against all common sense, he obeyed Jesus' crazy command to continue to go back out and fish again. In verse 8, he surprisingly responds to Christ's miracle by admitting his own sinfulness. So then when we arrive at verse 11, our final verse, we shouldn't be surprised that Peter's third response to Christ follows in this, this same line of apparent imprudence. Peter's last response, and that of his companions, was to leave everything they had and follow Jesus. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. All of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they tell us about this calling of the fishermen. But only Luke tells us about this miraculous catch of fish. And I ask myself, well, why? There might be lots of different reasons, but I think, knowing what I know of Luke's Gospel, I think Luke has got money on the mind. He's got money on the mind. Luke's gospel, more than the other gospels, highlights in Jesus' own words, you can't love both money and God. And as one commentator puts it, discipleship demands, and hear this, discipleship demands that, no, that one no longer be a slave to wealth, 
or cling to possessions as though they're your source of security or social position. Put differently, to follow Christ is to give him complete primacy. He's number one. You see what I'm getting at? You see what Luke here, I think, is getting at? For these fishermen, this was the, this was the best catch of their life. In the span of a few hours, their, their tiny fishing business suddenly flourished into a Fortune 500 company, or at least the Wall Street Journal's business of the week. And yet, for James and John, Peter and Andrew, this growing enterprise no longer held any further attraction. Despite great social, economic, vocational costs, these men decided to leave fishing for good. And against any economic impulses that would be natural to most of us, they decided never to turn this extraordinary catch into copious amounts of cash. You see, Luke doesn't record that these fellows docked their boats, then they went to town, then they sold their fish, then they did the town, and then they followed Jesus. Rather, he states, and when they brought their boats to land, they left everything. Then and there, they left the boats, they left their occupation, they left the fish, the prophet, and followed Jesus. Now listen, sure, we're not called to follow the exact same life, live the same life as Simon Peter, these other men, the great apostles of our Lord, but we are all commanded, and this is what Luke chapter 5, 1 through 11 is getting at, we're all commanded, when we see who Jesus is, when we see who we are in light of him, we're all commanded to leave every first love in this world in order to follow Jesus first. We're to live in faith and obedience, laying down all that we have in order to follow our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, our boats, our nets, our great catch. Lord, you can have everything, even my one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, black fish, blue fish, old fish, all these new fish. You can have it all. You can have everything because I'm completely yours. And they left everything. They left everything and followed him. I don't know why you're here this morning. Maybe this is your first time in church in years. Maybe you wandered off the streets. Maybe you came because a friend invited you. Maybe you're a church member here and you always come to church. Maybe you're a church member here and you're feeling guilty about not coming to church so you finally came to church. Maybe you're sincerely exploring the claims of Christianity and you're visiting churches in the area to see what different pastors say about Jesus. I don't know why you're here. What I do know is, guess what, you're here. And what I know also is that God wanted you here and he wanted you to hear, here to hear what you just heard today and what I'm about to say and finish with. Christ commands you, this is you, right now to come follow him. Come follow me. It's decision time. It's time for you, like Peter and Andrew did and the apostles here did in the story, it's time for you to make a decision. To stay with the fish or to leave everything and follow Jesus. Stay with the fish or leave everything and follow Jesus. Now, I don't know what form the fish might take in your life, and I don't know precisely what following Jesus will look like for you. What I do know is that he is calling some of you by his Spirit right now, just like he called them back then. There is an immediacy to Christ's command. He is calling you to move beyond your old life, perhaps your old and sinful life, and into a new and vibrant life to leave behind your, your past and everything that has hindered you from coming to Jesus and to bow before him, to cling to him, to walk beside him, and to follow him. And if that's the case, you can talk to me afterwards. You could talk to Pastor Eric, other pastors, the elders here. You can also pray right now. I'm going to end with a prayer, and this prayer won't save you. Jesus saves you, but it might help you at this moment form your thoughts and your Emotions, what you're thinking, what you're feeling, and help you express this desire you're thinking and feeling about following Jesus. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you call me right now to repent. That is to, to move away from my old life and, and come to a new life. 
to repent and to believe, to have faith in Jesus as Lord and, and to follow, follow him and to do so without delay. So give me this very hour the understanding and the ability to do this. Capture my, my heart but also my allegiance this day. And in your goodness, Lord, do more than save me. Make me, too, a fisher of men. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.